what happened in 2016 Investing certainly was, was part of the thing that he was worried about in corruption with that nation. And, and that is holding, absolutely appropriate. Holding the funding. Yeah. But to be clear, what you just described is a quid pro quo. It is funding will not flow unless the investigation into the, into the Democratic server uh, happened as well. We, we, do, we do that all the time with foreign policy. When McKinney said yesterday that he was really upset with the political influence in foreign policy, that was one of the reasons he was so upset about this. And I have news for everybody. Get over it. There's going to be political influence in foreign policy. To that, former acting U.S. Solicitor General under President Obama, Neil Katyal, tweeted, quote, This is the textbook definition of an impeachable offense, and the White House Chief of Staff has just admitted it. Yeah, and he wants us to get over it, too. Joining us now, host of MSNBC's Politics Nation and president of the National Action Network, Reverend Al Sharpton. Former U.S. attorney for the Northern District of Alabama and an MSNBC contributor, Joyce Vance. And state attorney for Palm Beach County, Dave Ehrenberg. Wow. Guys, do we have a lot to get to um, as we I'm working through this. I'm trying to get over it. Uh, Joyce Vance, um, I see impeachability. Uh, do you see criminality here? And God knows what's on the record for Mick Mulvaney to come out and try and get people to get over this. We've been looking at criminality here for a while, and I think Mulvaney put the final nail in the coffin yesterday. A and here's why it's important, Meek. It's very, uh, I think, critical at this point that we think about the difference in the two standards here, impeachability and criminality, because impeachment mm -hmm. is just about somebody losing their job. Criminality is about someone losing their liberty and going to prison. And so in our system, we impose much higher standards and much greater protections when we talk about criminality. The president keeps complaining about he wants confrontation rights and, and other rights that go along with a criminal setting. But for impeachment purposes, Congress is looking at whether or not high crimes and misdemeanors have been committed. That's a political judgment that's left up to Congress by the Constitution. But the clear case, the case that everyone has always agreed would support impeachment would be if the president engaged in outright criminality. And here we right. see bribery and campaign finance violations. So Dave Ehrenberg, um, do you see criminality here? And, and what, what impact do you think Mick Mulvaney's admission and then later <coughs> scrambling retraction will have on this scandal overall? Yeah, I agree with Joyce uh, here. I mean, yesterday's press conference was a clown show. I mean, Mulvaney went rogue, and it's not uncommon when a conspiracy falls apart for the individual conspirators to start pointing the finger at each other. They're panicking. And that's what Mulvaney did yesterday. He panicked and he pointed the finger at President Trump as an attempt to save his own hide. You know, he was saying, yeah, this all happened. It happens all the time. It's a, essentially a quid pro quo. The problem with that is that it does seal President Trump's fate for impeachment, and it could lead to Mulvaney wearing a pair of handcuffs in the future for campaign finance violations, possible bribery, extortion. Remember, President Nixon's chief of staff served prison time for Watergate, and that could ultimately be Mulvaney's fate. I think at that point, the jury will have to decide which of Mulvaney's two statements yesterday was more credible, the one he did voluntarily, spontaneously, on camera, or the carefully written letter that he submitted hours later to try to walk it back that was clearly vetted by President Trump and a bunch of lawyers. So when Mulvaney took uh, the position as acting chief of staff, he did away with a lot of the restraints that chief of staff John Kelly tried to put on the White House. He more or less said that he wasn't going to try to keep the president in line. He was going to embolden him to do what he wanted. And we've seen very little attempts for him to push back. Uh, the president yesterday, Reverend, uh, was, was said that you know he was in Dallas. And when he was asked about Mulvaney's briefing, he initially said he didn't see much of it. Uh, but he was told that he did well. That was before, of course, the cleanup statement was issued later. You know the president. You know how he deals with things. You know his sense of loyalty. If the walls are closing in on Mulvaney right now, and as Joyce and Dave just both said, he could face real, real potentially legal concerns, how do you think the president reacts? Should Mick Mulvaney perhaps uh, not feel too comfortable in his position right now? Mick Mulvaney should go get his own attorney because the president will throw him to the wolves and not uh, defend him at all. Clearly, uh, what Mulvaney did 
was say, yes, we did rob the bank, and we are bank robbers. And the head of the gang, which is Donald Trump, is saying, I didn't rob anything. He acted on his own. That's essentially where he's going to go. The only thing that was missing yesterday uh, after Mulvaney's statement, and I'm not Joyce, but the only thing was missing is someone should have came in and read him his rights because he confessed <laughs> yeah. to a crime right in front of national television. And uh, Donald Trump is not going to go down with him, though I think he absolutely brought Donald Trump down. And I think in many ways cemented the impeachment of Donald Trump. It was incredible. Also yesterday, U.S. Ambassador to the European Union, Gordon Sundland, testified under subpoena <clears throat> as part of the House impeachment inquiry into President Trump. And according to the New York Times, <clears throat> Sundland told congressional investigators that Trump delegated American foreign policy on Ukraine <clears throat> to his personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, a directive he said he disagreed with, but nonetheless followed. The Times reports Sundland testified he did not understand until later that Giuliani's goal may have been an effort, quote, to involve Ukrainians directly or indirectly in the president's 2020 re-election campaign. Uh, Dave Ehrenberg and Joyce Vance, if you could both answer, starting with Dave, does this uh, testimony expose Rudy Giuliani uh, maybe to charges? What was your reaction to Sundland's testimony? Uh, yes, it does. It provides more evidence that Giuliani was conducting shadow diplomacy in possible violation of federal criminal statutes like cons uh, conspiracy to commit bribery, extortion, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. But I think his real criminal liability comes in violating campaign finance laws and the Foreign Agent Registration Act. Giuliani may say, hey, I was just working on behalf of the president, so essentially that's immunity, which it's not. Also, it increases the chances of impeachment for the president from 100% to 1,000%. And then it's not even a defense against charges of campaign finance violations or other federal conspiracy charges. And lastly, Giuliani needs to be reminded that he doesn't get the benefit of the get out of jail free card that the president enjoys from the Department of Justice's internal memo that says you can't indict a sitting president. That doesn't extend to the president's personal lawyer. Just ask Michael Cohen. Dave Joyce? is absolutely right. I, I agree 100% with Dave here that Giuliani has a lot of different types of exposure. He said publicly that he doesn't have a lawyer because he doesn't need one. He does need a lawyer. The interesting aspect uh, of what's happening here is another thing that Dave talked about earlier, and prosecutors see this all the time. When a conspiracy comes apart, everyone tries to save themselves. And that's where prosecutors typically find their best evidence. So four of Giuliani's alleged co-conspirators are already in federal custody. It looks likely that at least a few of them are talking. Some of them have been released with a large bonds attached to their release. And Giuliani at some point will have to engage in a calculus of whether he wants to save himself or whether he still believes he can rely on this president to keep him afloat. Well, and to that point, Joyce, I also think we saw, when you talk about co-conspirators, Ambassador Sondland yesterday basically admitting he was a dupe. And we saw members of Congress come out and say on both sides, well, mostly on the Democratic side, saying that he was well-intentioned. He meant well and that he was really just a stooge for Rudy Giuliani. So I guess this is perhaps the first domino, Joyce. Like, who else do you think follows that lead? Um, so publicly that serves the administration. Sondland, I think, is at best a dupe. The timeline is not in his favor, Susan. He, by the time May 23rd, where he says he still doesn't know that Giuliani is engaging in shadow diplomacy over the president's <laughs> desires to have an investigation, there's already been public reporting in the New York Times and a lot of controversy about Giuliani's travel. So whether or not his position that he's a dupe holds up or not, I think, is, is anyone's question at this point in time. But now the players are divided into two groups, essentially, into witnesses. We see these career employees at the State Department, perhaps at other agencies, who will come forward and testify about what they observed, what they knew, what they saw. 
and also we work in closer to this circle of people who at least arguably were part of, let's call it a conspiracy, but, mm -hmm. but perhaps this effort to run a shadow diplomacy. And it will be the first few of those insiders to crack and break and testify that will be defining here much like